Hello, my name is Beck Mitchell. I am a physiotherapist, corporate wellness consultant, meditation teacher and nutritionist. And I am here today to talk to you about how to eat yourself calm. This is a topic that I am really passionate about because I do believe that we have the ability to cultivate a calmer life through our food choices, our exercise and some other daily practices, all of which we will be covering in today's workshop. So I think often when we're thinking about work, we tend to think of it as something that is at the opposite end of the spectrum to health. But I do believe that it's possible for us to actually combine the two to allow ourselves to use the routine of work to actually create a healthier and calmer life. So we're going to touch on today the five pillars that we suggest are the most beneficial when it comes to trying to make your life less high stress, less anxious and more peaceful and calm. So what exactly is stress? So the definition of stress is any sort of uncomfortable emotional experience that is accompanied by predictable biochemical, physiological and behavioral changes. But is stress always a bad thing and why do we feel stress? So stress is essentially the combination of reactions um, that, is re that we generally refer to as a fight or flight response. And fight or flight response you probably have heard of and it is a survival mechanism that we've been relying on since pre-evolutionary times. And it's basically a priming that occurs when our body thinks that we're in a dangerous situation. And previously that was really helpful because things like amping up our heart rate, getting us breathing a little quicker was preparing us to either fight or to run away. But nowadays we get that same response from things that aren't that dangerous to our life. So things perhaps like a fight with your partner over which Netflix channel to be Netflix series to be watching, or perhaps um, that feeling of stress that you might get with a looming deadline or public speaking. But unfortunately, we still get that exact same bodily response that we used to get when we were running away from a tiger or a bear. So what happens when we have stress for a prolonged period of time? Because obviously there are times even in our life now where stress is necessary. And that might be a scenario like when you're driving and suddenly someone runs out in the road in front of you and you need to be able to respond to that really quickly. And so stress is necessary. But when we have that normal acute response, we get this spike in all of the stress hormones like epinephrine and cortisol, which increases our heart rate, our blood pressure, our breathing rate, um, which are all things that are helpful in that situation. But when we have acute stress, what immediately follows that is something called the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's essentially like the break um, on the accelerator of stress. And it actually helps to dampen that stress response, bring us back down to a normal level of heart rate, blood pressure, etc. And so the issue arises when that acute stress turns into something that is more ongoing. So if we have that initial kind of acute um, feeling when we're stressed and then it doesn't go away, this is where it becomes chronic. And this is essentially, we're not getting any breaking of the accelerator. We're not getting any parasympathetic activation or minimal parasympathetic activation. And this can result from a lifestyle that maybe is too busy or, you know, too constantly stressful without any activities in our day that actually can bring us back down into that parasympathetic state. And if we do start to chronically be in this stress state, we get chronically elevated levels of the stress hormone that you might, may have heard of called cortisol. So chronic cortisol, there's a lot of research around this and it does result in a number of different things. So you may have heard that um, if we've got too much cortisol in our system, it can help, it can slow our metabolism down, which can then result in weight gain, unfortunately. Um, Elevated stress for long periods of time can also create issues with our immune system. It increases our risk of certain diseases, as you can see on this little list. It means we can't build muscle as easily. It tends to increase gastrointestinal issues. So if you're always kind of stressed out and feeling that cortisol levels um, constantly, then you're more prone to having IBS and those sorts of problems as well. And as you would all know, when we are more stressed and we've got that chronic level of high stress hormone in our body, we're more likely to suffer from sleep issues as well. All right. 
So what happens when we have that chronic stress? We have kind of two options. And one option is to start addressing the cause of the stress and perhaps add some things into our life that are going to decrease that chronic level of stress. The other option is what we refer to as cats. And this is probably the more common coping strategy that most of us use, unfortunately. And this is essentially using things like caffeine to try and amp us back up when we're not feeling at our best because we're so constantly stressed. Um, alcohol to try and calm us down at the end of the day or even drugs perhaps. Tobacco to give us a distraction, go out and have a cigarette when we're feeling stressed at work or perhaps sugar as a relief from our emotional feelings. And obviously um, these aren't necessarily the best way of dealing with stress because certainly whilst they may give us some relief at the time, they're not actually fixing the problem um, that was causing the stress in the first place. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we actually create a change in our body that's fixing the problem rather than simply um, blocking it out with those cat strategies. And this comes to our five pillar approach, which is encompassing everything from diet to exercise, what we call mental exercise or mental fitness, sleep, and then also our work life practices, which we'll touch on at the end. So the main topic for today is diet. So we're going to delve into this one a little more deeply than the others, but they are all equally important. So essentially when it comes to diet, it can be something that can be a bit of a headache for a lot of us. There's always different theories coming out. There's different books out every week around what we should and shouldn't be eating. But what we're going to focus on today is what the evidence suggests is the best food or the best nutrition sources to try and support our body and our brain so they can feel at their best, so that we're less stressed, we're more focused and we're more productive. And essentially, if you do have that right platform and you're feeding your brain and your body the right nutrients, you're able to work more effectively. You'll notice that your performance when you're running or doing strength workouts will improve. Our healing and our immune system is better. Our ability to problem solve and be creative improves. But most importantly, it will help to dampen down that cortisol production, which is what causes that sensation of chronic stress. All right, so what does our brain need? So there's a few really essential nutrients that are required, so our macro and our micronutrients. So the premium fuel for our brain is glucose, um, which is produced in a number of different ways. We also need hydration, so water is vital. Omega-3 fats, we would have all um, probably heard about our omega-3 fats. And then of course, protein. But then it comes also to our micronutrients. And these are things that some of us may have had to take supplements for in the past, potentially if we've been notably lower in these areas. Um, but these are also necessary for our brain to have optimal function. Now, carbohydrates. This is a a controversial topic <laughs> and I personally have come across so many different articles preaching either one way or the other when it comes to do we carb or do we not carb. Now, when it comes to the most um, high quality evidence, we do know that we do need some carbohydrates for our brain to work at its best and also for our body to function well for our um, ability to exercise. So carbohydrates though, obviously there's different types of carbohydrates and they're all stored quite differently and then released quite differently. So the general group of carbohydrates are stored in our muscles and in our liver and they, any excess of them is converted, converted to fat, which is probably where it gets its bad name. Um, but it is, it is used through exercise and through mental activity. So if you do only eat as much as you need, then there's no problem with them at all. Um, generally, and we're going to talk a little bit about low GI and high GI carbohydrates, but you do need to be a bit careful about which of these you're choosing to consume because if you are having too many of those high GI carbohydrates, that's where we tend to get that real spike in energy, spike in our blood glucose level, and then a drop quite quickly. So you can see in these pictures here on the left is a high glycemic index food, and you can see that it releases the energy really fast, but then it drops your energy really quickly because your energy is all been released and then you don't have anything. So you're left feeling hungry really quickly. And if you've ever experienced that sensation of hanger, I know I certainly get hangry from time to time. That's often where our blood sugar has dropped quite low um, after a really high glycemic meal or snack. And then it drops really low, leaving us feeling quite irritable and grumpy 
because our blood sugar is so low, which then makes us crave another high GI snack because it gets released so quickly and we get dropped again. So you end up on this roller coaster ride of emotions. Um, whereas if we stick to our low GI carbohydrates, which I've got up on the screen here for you now, we're much more likely to have that really nice smooth trajectory. And that is what we want when it comes to food because that is meant, that's what's going to keep us feeling far more calm and at peace because hanger is certainly not um, a good thing when it comes to trying to cultivate a calm sense of mind. So I've got a list here for you. Um, this isn't a fully exhausted list, but you've got wholemeal um, bread, whole grain bread. So basically things that have been that haven't been processed as much and that come more in their natural form and things that have got more graininess or, or are more brown generally. So our white carbohydrates tend to be the higher GI ones. So looking at this list, things like brown rice, quinoa is excellent, sweet potato and pumpkin, um, our, all of our legumes are excellent and vegetables generally are low GI as well. So what can we do when it comes to nutrition at work? Because we all know some of us have that tendency um, when you're at work to go to the cafe in the building and then the first thing you see is a cookie and if you're feeling hungry, um, you'll immediately go for that high GI option, like I said before, because it gives you that immediate spike. But we definitely don't want that roller coaster ride when we're at work. So some options that you might have a look at are things like a um, plate of veggies or you've seen those, I don't know if there's those like Middle Eastern um, restaurants sometimes that do a plate where there's like some hummus and some falafels and some different um, other options like salads and tabbouleh and those sorts of things can be nice. Um, Japanese can be good, but just making sure that you're not getting the ones with the white rice. So get brown rice. Um, sushi if you are getting sushi or get the green rolls that have got more lettuce and vegetables and stuff in them otherwise sashimi with edamame is an excellent option so looking at things that aren't going to give us the, the roller coaster high in protein and high in those um, nutrients as well mexican can also be a good option if that is something that you like the taste of because you usually have that protein and you've got your healthy fats with the avocado. And it's just about looking around and trying to find things with the most color. So you've got lots of vegetables, bit of protein, bit of healthy fats and some healthy carbohydrates so that we're keeping ourselves on a nice straight trajectory with our energy. Now, whole foods. And I think if we're going to argue, you can argue all day about what diet it is that's the best. Is it paleo? Is it ketogenic, etc.? But I think I'm a really big believer in it's just about moderation of most foods, trying to maximize your vegetables and your natural foods. But this is the one rule that I always stick to, and that is to avoid foods that are highly processed because they tend to have um, a lot of things in them like preservatives and coloring. And we know that those sorts of things can affect our mood, um, particularly, particularly if you're or really sensitive to those to those things um, but also they've been often stripped of their nutrients so we're not getting all those beautiful phytonutrients you get from the colorful food colorful fruit and vegetables you're not getting as much fiber you're not getting the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and anti-inflammatories which are all going to keep our system calm and nice and steady rather than those high processed foods that just leave us feeling ratty and erratic so opting steer away from the drive through and opting to either cook your own food or going to restaurants or cafes where you know that they produce food that's minimal intervention. So some things that you can eat, and this is based on research so things that we know does help to calm down our cortisol levels in our body so spinach we all um we all know the the popeye spinach is is good for us um anything that's rich in vitamin c so that could be we've got oranges and capsicum there but um there's lots of different fruits and vegetables that are high in vitamin c goji berries um fatty fish which is for that omega-3 that we discussed a little while ago and nuts, again, good protein, good healthy fats. Asparagus is, is known to be a cortisol dampening food. Beans, barley, and then anything that's high in zinc, which is actually animal meat, but obviously just being um, conservative with the amount of meat that you do consume because there are some other negative health benefits, especially if you consume red meat too often. Um, and then almonds and walnuts. So you can see this is fairly similar to a Mediterranean diet, which is one of the most evidence-based diets when it comes to longevity and living a healthy life. And essentially it's coming, it comes down to lots of fruit, lots of veg, nuts, healthy fish, and a fairly straightforward approach.
and you can take a little screenshot of that too if um if you need a list it can be helpful just to have a list of things all right so this is onto the section um, where i lose a bit of popularity and that is caffeine and why caffeine isn't your best friend when it comes to calming down your nervous system so some of you will know this because you may be particularly sensitive to caffeine and we do know that different humans have different levels of sensitivity so some of us can have an espresso shot before bed and then sleep relatively well whereas some of us if we have a coffee after 12 o'clock midday we end up being unable to sleep that night so keeping that in mind we do know that caffeine does stimulate our adrenal glands and increases our levels of um, adrenaline and cortisol in our system and we know that that can actually increase those levels by about 30 percent with just one espresso shot or one cappuccino we know also that our cortisol levels are highest in the morning. So if you're going to have your coffee, try and at least wait a couple of hours after you've woken up before you have that first coffee because your cortisol stress hormone levels are already peaking in the morning because that's part of what helps us wake up in the morning. And so if you add caffeine into that and you're rushing to get the kids ready for school, get yourself ready for work, get, get out and into public transport, or if you're working from home, then getting yourself rushing to get in front of the Zoom meeting, um, that can really create this massive cortisol storm, which is obviously not ideal when it comes to trying to start our day feeling calm and relaxed. So make sure you time it effectively, maybe wait two to three hours before you have your first coffee. Have it with food because that damp the cortisol effect and try not to have any I mean I personally don't have any after 12 p.m. but if you do know you tolerate it quite well maybe not having any in after 3 p.m. which will improve your quality of sleep but also just mean that generally your stress levels coming into the evening are nice and low meaning that it's easier to fall asleep and also to have a relaxing evening after work which we all want and you'll find too if you're not having as much coffee in the day you're then less likely to be craving alcohol at night to try and calm you back down um, which is obviously not a great cycle to be getting into all right so moving on to exercise and this is something that I think we often don't think about when it comes to stress. And I'm gonna talk about the different types of exercise because it does differ as to what's the most helpful when it comes to reducing our stress levels. But I think often most of us, we kind of think about exercise, like you've got to do it to like keep your weight under control, to look a certain way or to make sure we live for a long time. But we often forget about the other benefits like the impact that it has on our mood, um, on our energy levels and on our ability to stay calm throughout the day. So we're gonna talk about a bit about that now. So our suggestion is you should be trying to move for at least an hour each day and that includes your incidental exercise so you know if you're commuting and there's 10 minutes of walking at the start of your day and 10 minutes of walking at the end you can add that in if you do a walk at lunch or you're pottering around the office while you're on your phone you can add that in taking the stairs so it is relatively easy to rack up that one hour in your day if you just take the options that are available to you there and then in addition to that, it's ideal to try and get in three to four set exercise sessions a week. But this is where it comes to the point of which sort of exercise is it that we're doing? Because not every exercise is is equal when it comes to reducing stress. So high intensity workouts like F45 are particularly popular at the moment because you kind of feel like you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. You go in there and you leave 45 minutes later and you're sweating and feel like you've done a great workout. And certainly they can play a role as part of your exercise routine. But if you know that you are someone who generally does suffer from a really high level of stress or you're going through a particularly stressful period in your life, I can't stress enough that a lot of the word, use of the word stress, um, I can't stress enough that it really is better to try and bring your exercise into the realm of more relaxing forms of exercise. So something calmer like yoga or Pilates where you'll get exercise benefits, but you're not actually ramping up your cortisol levels even more through your exercise. Or if you want to keep a balance, then maybe sticking to like two or three of those higher intensity sessions a week and then doing a couple of those kind of lower level, um, more gentle forms of exercise that aren't going to leave you feeling like your heart's racing like crazy and perhaps leave you feeling even more stressed than you were to start with.
I think we all know our own bodies quite well. So you'll be able to figure out which, which forms of exercise kind of work best for you and which are the ones that maybe increase your stress levels a little. And for some of us, yoga may make us feel more stressed because we just dislike it. So find things that you enjoy and that make you stay in the moment, which brings me beautifully to my next point, which is mental exercise. Now, the research here recently has gone through the roof. We know so much more about this than we did 50 years ago. Um, this has been something that has been part of many religions and many cultures for thousands of years, but it's something that the West, that Western medicine has only really understood, probably really only in the last kind of five to 10 years. So we now know that through a daily practice of something that is bringing our mind into the present, calming down our breathing, slowing down our brain and allowing us to essentially relax um, will help to kind of counteract those levels of stress that we experience in our work life or our home life. So I'd suggest trying to add in one thing like this each day. And it doesn't have to be going and getting an hour long massage every day, although that sounds quite nice, um, or, you know, doing an hour of meditation, but maybe it's a five minute breathing exercise or downloading an app like there's, I think that we've got Smiling Mind on the slide. You might find Calm or Headspace or any of those apps works well for you. And they've got different um, time frame options, but actually dedicating the time in your day to care for your mind. Because it's certainly, it's one thing if we're eating the right foods, we're getting some exercise, um, we're not having too much coffee, but if you want to go that next level and really make sure you are caring for your brain, and I think really there's nothing, no better use of our time than making sure our mind is at its best, um, then adding in one of these things each day will start to make a really big difference to how your overall frame of mind is. Um, and it's, it does take a while. You might find that, you know, after the first week, you're not noticing a massive difference difference but usually after a few weeks you will start to notice that it's starting to change how you react to things and how you feel in your day. So that brings me now to sleep. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a bit of a chat about sleep because sleep is one of the things that makes a massive difference to our stress levels. So you can see here, um, one of the things that happens throughout the day is that we can, that we can get inflammation, there can be um, damage to our adrenal glands and our cortisol receptors. Um, and so as we sleep, not only does it help to repair like any muscle damage or other illness in our body, but it actually helps with our hormonal, um, hormonal repair as well. In the long term, it helps to produce and boost our, our um, serotonin and dopamine production. It helps with our cognitive function and our memory, memory formation. And then it also helps with neural pathway, pathways, which need repair um, in the cases of anxiety and depression. And so we know sleep is a superpower, but I think the key is really about looking at how we can make it more of a focus in our daily lives because so many of us, we end up sitting watching TV in the evenings and then it's suddenly it's like 11 o'clock and you've got to get up at six and there's by the time you get to bed, you're only getting six hours sleep. And we know that for optimal um, mind, for an optimal mind, we need to be getting seven to eight hours of sleep each night. And that differs a bit from person to person and you can probably, you'll know if you're someone who needs more than others. Um, but really prioritizing it is the key. So here's a few other sleep tips for you. So the environment is really important. Um, you want to make sure that you are in as much darkness as possible. So you may need to use an eye mask if, you're, if your apartment or your house where you live doesn't have adequate curtains. Um, temperature. This is a tricky one, but the general advice is about 18 degrees um, but obviously, you know, some people find that a bit too chilly, but that is technically the ideal temperature because it helps to cool our brain down and our brain needs to cool down before it's able to fall asleep at night. Um, minimizing screens. So how many of you spend the last hour before you go to bed watching TV or on your phone? It's most of us. And that is one of the things that will really impact your ability to fall into a good quality sleep straight away when you go to bed. So trying to reduce that, I'd advise, we all know this, but it's a matter of actually implementing it. Taking your phone, plugging it into the charger, set the alarm an hour before you go to bed and then don't touch it. And ideally in that hour before bed, you're doing relaxing things like reading a book under a, a dimly lit lamp or having a warm bath or chatting with your family members or doing some light stretching. 
Um, you can use, there's all different things you can use on your phone now to try and change the lighting to make it less impactful. So if you do have to do work, then using these sorts of things. But ideally, we are switching off our technology an hour before bed. Um, and then routine. So our brains will know that it's almost time for bed and start set, sending out um, melatonin, which is our sleep hormone, if we have a regular routine. If you tend to go to bed at all sorts of weird different hours and wake up at different times, then it becomes really hard for your brain to create that routine. And it ends up sort of relying on an alarm or you know you you going to bed and hopefully then producing the melatonin if the room is dark enough so by having that routine our brain knows what to expect and then it makes it a lot easier to wake up in the morning because you'll know that feeling when the alarm goes off and you're in the deepest of sleeps and you get kind of jerked into um, being awake and it just feels pretty revolting so by training your brain when the alarm goes off you'll be sort of already coming out of the sleep cycle and feeling quite good so to finish with, we are going to touch on workplace practices. So these are things that you can do in your workday every day to try and make work a place that cultivates calm instead of stress. One of the things I think people don't do enough is actually taking breaks. So every 30 to 45 minutes, you need to be stepping away from your desk and taking a rest break for one to two minutes. So a lot of you, if you're the sort of person that gets really engaged in your work, you might actually need to set an alarm and actually do this because it makes the world of difference and it will mean even though it might feel like you're being unproductive at the time it means that when you sit back at your desk and you re-engage with your work you'll be more energetic and your mind will be fresher and you'll be able to do better quality work as well um, eat al fresco, not al desco. Sorry about that cheesy line, but it is true. If you can get outside and experience like a little bit of fresh air, see some greenery, um, you know, do a little bit of exercise, you will actually improve your, um, it will reduce the levels of cortisol and enhance your happy hormones as well. And organization. So one of the things that can cause stress is a feeling of a lack of control over our day. So I'm personally not naturally someone who's very organized, but I've cultivated practices that allow me to feel like I'm in control. I write a list at the start of the day with the most important things at the top that I need to get done and I get them done first so that I feel like I'm achieving things. And that's one of the key things when it comes to stress, like making sure that you're planning things out to reduce your stress in the long run. Um, having a tidy home and a tidy work environment is underrated as well. So if your space around you is cluttered and crazy, it's hard for you to feel calm. Whereas if everything's like in its place, maybe you've even got a little pot plant on your desk, it does help you to feel a little calmer at work and feel more like it's a place for relaxation rather than this like crazy place for stress. And then home. So obviously at work, we'll, we do what we can to try and keep it as calm as possible, but it is really nice to try and make home a haven. And if you are working from home at the moment, then it's important that you're kind of creating that barrier between the two so that you've got obviously somewhere where you work, maybe you've got a desk set up or maybe it's the kitchen bench, but then once the workday finishes at a certain time and you've finished your work for the day, you close down your computer. And if you're in a separate space, you walk away from that area and you don't go back there. Or if you're maybe having to work at the dining table due to space, actually pack everything away or even stick a sheet over it or something so that you're not having to look at it for the rest of the day. Um, try and create, if it's possible with your role, try and create some boundaries around when you do and don't check your emails. So have control around that. Maybe after seven o'clock in the evenings, you stop checking emails and don't check them the first moment that you wake up. Because again, our cortisol levels are high in the morning. And if the first thing that you do is immediately check your emails, you're going to feel stressed. Um, and also, yeah, so other things that you can do, um, is when you're, when you're in certain environments, make that a time for mindful practice. So perhaps every time you have a shower, be like, this is my calm time for the day. I'm going to just focus on the sensation as it runs over my body, the smell of the shampoo and the body wash and all those sorts of things. Um, or perhaps when you're commuting, once you are commuting again, if you're sitting on the train, using that time to plug in, listen to Headspace or something and actually use that time for calm. And we've sort of touched on um, the exercise piece as well. But if you do exercise, then try and use that as a reminder at the end of the session to do something calming afterwards. So like if you've gone for a run, when you get home, do some deep breathing and some stretching or do a little brief meditation.
So our take home messages is that stress is a hormonal and neuromotive response. So often we live our lives in this kind of chronic state of stress without even realizing it. So by actually starting to pay a little bit more attention to how our body's feeling, we are able to counteract it a little better by adding in some of these daily lifestyle practices that we've talked about today. So ideally, by getting rid of the cats, <laughs> so getting rid of those negative stress responses, we're focusing on nourishing our bodies with foods that make us feel energetic and in a good mood. Um, we're getting exercise and focusing on making sure we're getting the right exercise in. We're giving ourselves a little bit of time each day to do a calming mindfulness practice, whether that's yoga, meditation, or even getting a massage prioritizing sleep, and then finally making sure that we are focusing on cultivating a calm um, environment for ourselves at work and at home. So I hope that you've all found that helpful. And even if you just take away one thing from today, because I know we've touched on a lot, but if there's one thing that you can take away from today and change that one thing, you will start to notice a big difference when it comes to your overall stress. So pick one thing that you know that you're not great at, and then after today, try and continue working on that for at least the next 30 days. And then usually 30 days is enough time for you to start noticing a difference in yourself. And then you'll be able to keep going without too much trouble. Thank you so much for joining me.